User groups with lots to say, interviews and more. No way! Sharing great ideas in the tech community. Fascinating conversations, a plethora of information. Find out for yourself today at Ugtastic.com. Hi, it's Mike with Ugtastic. I'm sitting here at the SCNA 2013 conference in Chicago. Right now I'm sitting down with Karina Cizona, who is just giving a talk on schemas for the real world. Uh, she talked about how we can think, or we should think more about how we're either inclusive, uh, our, our applications are inclusive or exclusive, and how we're approaching our users and, and think about uh, uh, how they feel using our software. Uh, thank you for great, uh, taking the time to sit down with me. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks. I've been wanting to do this for a while. So <laughs> this is great. Great. So, so your talk, can you tell us a little bit more about what's what your presentation was and, and how you came to that topic? Yeah, it's always a little bit hard to summarize because it's, um, it's unusual, I think. Um, it's not something we have books about where we've already had some thoughts planted. Um, but essentially, it really comes out of my work as both a developer and a sex educator mm -hmm. and how those combined gave me some insights into how people feel about software. Um, I think a lot of times we're creating features and we're really excited about them. So we have a sense of our own excitement, but we don't have a really good idea of how the users feel, and particularly when they're you know, quite the opposite of excited. Because um, when people are really unhappy, what they do is they walk away from an app, right? Mm -hmm. um, they, don't, they don't let you know that, that this isn't working for them. Um, so we lack that feedback loop. And so I got to hear from a lot of people as a sex educator um, they often bring up questions that are were initially unexpected to me. Right. Um, you know, if you think sex educator, um, a lot of people just think in terms of, you know, tell me how to have sex, mm -hmm. um, which are questions that occasionally come up, but most of the time it's actually much broader. Um, throughout our lifetime, we have different ways in which we as a sexual being and those around us as a sexual being have things come up, questions that don't really show up in books. How do I relate to people? How do I manage a relationship? You know, how things change in my life when I'm, say, married or have children. Mm -hmm. Those are all really relevant, um, and they are really the topic for me. Um, and you mentioned also that about being empathetic, that these people are often afraid yeah, or embarrassed. Yeah, in yeah. You can't be judgmental. Yeah, um, so the work I do as a sex educator is for a group called San Francisco Sex, Ed, uh, San Francisco sex Information, SF. SI. Wow. <laughs> We're used to just saying SPISI, so the actual names are actually hard for me to remember. Um, but you can just say SPISI. Um, yeah, so we run a hotline. It's been run for 40 years, completely by volunteers, and there's a really strict um, educational program behind that um, that's kind of world-renowned. Um, so one of the things that was really taught to us in training is that essentially there are two common questions that come up. And neither of them is what one would predict. But mm -hmm. one is essentially, am I normal? Right. Tremendous number of questions come down to am I normal? Not how do I do something, you know, is that okay? But just are other people in the world like me? And it really struck me that in any part of our lives and world, that comes up all the time in different ways. You know, am, am, I, am I not right in right. some way? Are there other people like me and can I find them? You know, can I have people in the world that validate my experience, my identity, you know, the choices that I make, all that kind of stuff. Um, all the time we're telling people, I don't recognize you, so you're wrong. Right. Um, and software is a really good or bad, depending on how you look at that, place where that happens, where our software is really, um, it is developed within the constraints of our own imagination. And so where we don't have a good sense of how marginalized people exist, mm -hmm. whatever their dimension is of being marginalized, um, and God knows there's infinite, um, then, then we can't really serve them. And so we create these bad user experiences completely oblivious to it. It's, it's definitely not out of mm -hmm. some sort of sense of, you know, you don't belong, you shouldn't use our app. It's just our own, you know, lack of awareness of how incredibly diverse humans are and how we relate to each other and what we care about um, as individuals and you know the people in our lives, how do we care about them, how we would describe ourselves to others, um, not just in a very personal way, but things like you know, ask questions like, you know, what's your profession? 
Right. Um, and I was really struck, for instance, kind of early, you know, we used to have those paper forms for magazines, for instance, that ask you, like, which of these 10 categories do you work in? Um, and I would always look at that and, you know, regardless of what I was doing, go, eh. You know, and, and it's so funny you mentioned that because I, I think about how I'm, I personally, for most stuff, tend to be in the, uh, the wire, I'm, let's see, I'm, I'm mid, not quite middle-aged white guy, you know, in, in Midwest who speaks English and is American. I'm, I fall pretty much, boop, in inside of the, uh, the the brackets for most things, but even going uh, onto a business site and saying what kind of business do you have when I try to do something with you, Tastic, I'm like, I am none right. of these, and this right. is so frustrating because I don't want to be any of those. Yeah, I'm not yeah. a sales company. I'm, and you're gonna mis you're gonna misunderstand me based on whatever I choose. Right. None of them are close enough. And I'm gonna pick something. I'm like, ah, oh, this is kind of like over there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, the other one that's really fun is when they have stuff like um, web and software engineering, and I'm looking at <laughs> going. You forced me to pick one. I yeah. don't know how to answer your question. Yeah, and then you're trying to think about well, what value am I gonna get if I from this specific source if I say web. You know what are they doing? That's a good point. You know what are yeah. they doing with this information? So in this context, I would say web maybe because I care more about some certain aspect of yeah. it. Yeah. But if yeah. they're giving me libraries to do calculations, well yeah. then I might just say I'm a software developer. Yeah, yeah. it's hard to know, and, and a fair number of times they're asking a question because they want to know how to monetize your data. Right. And so they're going to be sending stuff that you weren't expecting or, or adapting the software in some way to something that they think is, is most suited to you, but may not be. Um, so, so I was, like I said, I was really interested in this idea that, you know, everywhere we, we are constantly making choices for other people on who they're allowed to be, essentially, or who they're allowed to describe themselves as, um, even on really, you know, sort of bland stuff like, what's your job? Right. Um, and certainly much more personal much more personal um, things. And so this talk really came, it evolved over a series of years actually, where I was just collecting information out of just interest. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting to me and I wanted to be, be more aware. Mm -hmm. um, and it was on a great range of topics. One of the ones that I've really been exploring most recently is names. Um, our understanding in, in any given country of what a name is and can be is incredibly culturally um, constrained. Um, one, of, one of the interesting things to me, for instance, was to learn that the British think it's really weird that Americans have this whole middle name concept, really? the middle initial concept. But if you look at most Americans, you know, websites especially, it'll be first, middle, last. Right. Um, and we could train it usually to initial too, right. uh, which is all kind of funky. Um, there are many countries in which well, for instance, a lot of times we're, we're at least savvy enough to know that surname and last name are close to being the same, but we're too, we're too foolish in recognizing that they're not, they, they may seem similar, but they can actually be really different. A right. um, good example is, say, China, where a surname and a last name are not the same because one's family name is first. So. Anybody who is Chinese, for instance, filling in one of these Western forms has to ask themselves, what do you really want from me? As last name, are you asking what is, what is the last in my names? Right. Or are you asking me something about um, you know, my family? Um, and so it becomes complex. And this, is, this doesn't need to be complex right. at all. Um, there were some other interesting cases where I, as I started digging in deeper, I learned that um, People who descend from uh, Spanish or Portuguese mm -hmm. usually have some sort of tradition of building last names based on both the paternal and maternal side of the family. And so you get last names, uh, we're going to just call them last names, uh, that can be really long. And this is, this is a cultural decision that we honor both sides of our family. And so when you have children, your last name is not the same as their last name because they have different parents, right, than your oh, parents. Really? And so each time you've got a family with different last names, but they, they can see their family tree reflected in that name, and all of it is important. And so we have a lot of times as Americans 
this this constraint on length, and I, you saw an example of that in my talk, you know, where the field length has to be between one and five characters for, or 20, I'm sorry, between one and 20 characters for a name. Um, there are a tremendous number of people who have to decide now, what part of my name am I going to throw out? Which yeah. part of my family tree and history am I just going to pretend doesn't exist? That's crazy. Right. Our, our databases can totally tolerate things like varied length fields. Yeah, it's not 1972 where we have a, <laughs> right. a, a, right. a Tumblr that's trying to hold you know, a right. few bits of data. Right, the difference between cars and bar cars at this point is really important. Mm -hmm. There's, there's no longer any reason why we need to be that conservative about reserving space for a field. Yeah, because the trade-offs aren't there. Yeah, Maybe back in when it was just, oh my gosh, we have a computer. Okay, all right, I gotta, I, and people were just like, oh, I gotta truncate my name. Okay, fine, that's what computers need. And they were thinking about the computer. Right. Now we can think about well, what does a person need? Right. What do they need right. to, to have their, yeah. their, their personhood respected? Yeah. Um, I do want to just jump back to a point when you were talking about uh, with the sex education when you said, am I normal? Yeah. And, and thinking about our, our interfaces, how many times do we look at an interface and go, am I stupid or is everybody having problems with this? You know, <laughs> yeah. is, is healthcare.gov broken or am I stupid? Um, yeah, a lot of users will think they're the yeah. ones. They so that's, blame themselves. That, it sounds like that's a theme in our, our lives. Like, how do we, am I, am I normal? Am I normal for not having this yeah. understanding what's going on here? Yeah. Well, and aside having to raise those questions for yourself, mm -hmm. um, if you conclude the answer is it's not me, then you know that can be really alienating and potentially really you know provoking that that person you know to be told you're not you're mm -hmm. not normal. We don't recognize you. You're you know you you need to to adjust yourself. You you need to fit better. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that can be the subliminal message that people get out of those is, I'm not welcome here. Um, you know, one of the examples I bring up in the talk, for instance, is Facebook, uh, with a fair amount of lobbying of Facebook, eventually they added a relationship status of open relationship. Mm -hmm. And that seemed like a big step, except that they only allow you to list one partner. Right. So it's as if you're you know, married or otherwise in some sort of relationship where there's one to one partner. That's a problem because now that person can say they're in an open relationship, but they have to choose who essentially is the real relationship, yeah. which is the point of an open relationship is they're legitimate. All of your relationships are legitimate and there's, you know, there may or not be a rank order to them where you could say this is the top most relationship. So that, that's something that can be you know, really painful to have to make a choice like that. You know, and also, who's going to be mad at me? Right. If I choose this partner and say, like, <laughs> this is the one I'm going to tell you publicly about, that really says, like, you know, what does that say? Maybe I'm ashamed of you or yeah. you're not, you know, you had to you're less important to me. Right. Which, which maybe didn't affect the person who had to fill out the form, but it, 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 it does have yeah. a ripple effect yeah. down to somebody else who yeah. now feels like our lifestyle isn't... Right. And that's beyond lifestyle. I mean, that's, that's my relationships. I mean, right. how much more personal can you get than... You know, who do you love? Um, I think another problem with that kind of stuff is uh, even if you can kind of figure out a solution that works for you, when you have to make a choice down to one, it can feel like in some way you're being closeted, that you're saying to the rest of the world, you know, this is the only one that counts, or this is the only one I'm willing to talk about. Um, this is the only person I really recognize. And if that's not true for you, it, it can feel like a great big lie to both, both the person who's saying that and others who are looking upon that. So we've got a lot of problems, and relationship status isn't the only one. It's just a particularly interesting it's one that just, comes and up it's a lot. It's very obvious, and it's a, it also has a, a little bit of, a, a, a little edge enough to, to make it an interesting talk. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, because I get people coming up to me after this talk, and um, there are some people who re inevitably relate to it very personally, and typically the two topics on which they really um, are most sort of grat expressing gratitude that I addressed it are people who are transgender and people who are in open relationships and friends of both of those groups right. because those those parts of their lives and their personhood are so rarely recognized uh, not just on apps although it's a real big problem mm -hmm. there but in general so to have someone say we don't have the right as developers to decide who is valid and not is for them you know that's been something they've ranted about and to finally have mm -hmm. one person say we're wrong as developers, they're not wrong as people, is something 
you know, that uncommon enough that they, they finally got to have their point of view raised at all. And that's really a, a neat thing to be able to be in that position. But it shouldn't be one person. It should be all of us thinking in those terms all the time. And, and it, it, it also makes me think about how that, you know, as developers, we're supposed to be smart. We're supposed to be the ones who are paying attention to what's right. going on. Yeah. And, and, and aware of, of what's uh, some of the ramifications of, of our decisions. And I, I also just recently learned that there's um, even going to be legal changes around this oh. with, with the new legislation protecting uh, uh, transsexual, uh, uh, bisexual and transgender. Um, so there's, there's going to be more coming out of this than just we're evolving as a society. Yeah. There's also going to be, you have to be aware of these things so that way when you're designing your app, you may, might not need to be, want to be in a place where you're going to be uh, transgressing in some law. Yeah. Um, so this is something that's actually really rapidly changing in regards to gender. Just about a year ago, New South Wales, Australia opened up, uh, through a court case, uh, a, a, a third category of gender. Uh, so that one a particular person who had d pulled this lawsuit, uh, give, done this lawsuit, uh, won the right to essentially not be described as either male or female. So that is a officially legitimate way that you can be described on your passport and your driver's license. Mm -hmm. uh, the larger country overall of Australia then made it essentially a, a similar law. Right. And then this year, a couple months ago, Germany, um, kind of out of the blue, I'm sure there actually was a lot of people lobbying for this, but um, it just sort of showed up all of a sudden that they passed a law uh, related not so much to transgender people, but because they were recognizing that some children are born with indeterminate genitalia, right. which means that whatever gender they've been putting mm -hmm. on, a, on a birth certificate may not be how the child grows up and, and regards themselves and how their body develops. So Germany, as of last week it became official, is now allowing birth certificates to have uh, a gender e either indeterminate or blank. So we have right now this reality which is rapidly developing of binary gender is not going to work, not mm -hmm. just from a user experience perspective, but from a legal perspective. If we want to know someone's you know, legal name, legal gender, legal address, we're going to have to be open to the fact that those things are not what we assume they are. Mm -hmm. How, how do we cope with that? How do, we, how do we remain flexible enough for the world as it's constantly changing? Because it is, always, and this isn't the only dimension on which it is, always. So that was, that was really an interesting discovery, and uh, for me, a surprising development. I, I spoke in Australia a couple of months ago, and th they were thrilled that I brought up those, those laws in Australia, yeah. because there it's, it's fresh and very familiar. It's been a big topic of discussion. And they were excited that anyone else outside of Australia was worried yeah. at all. You know, yeah. thank you for recognizing <laughs> us. Yeah, you know what's going on in Australia? Where are you from? <laughs> well, no, I they could tell from the accent. Ah, well, thank you very much for taking the time to sit down with me. Thank I enjoyed you. It was your a talk. Pleasure. Enjoyed your talk, and and I enjoyed our conversation. Thank you very much. I did too. All right. User groups with lots to say, interviews and more. No way! Sharing great ideas in the tech community. Fascinating conversations, a plethora of information. Find out for yourself today at ugtastic.com.